Okay, uh, you guys can see the screen, right? Anyone? You can just type in the box. Yeah, okay, that's fine. So thank you so much for uh, joining us today. We'd be talking about epilepsy and the basic agenda of the session today uh, will be to differentiate between epilepsy and seizure by the end of this presentation, know various types of seizures and various types of epilepsy, and know the role of investigations, when to do, go for the investigation or not, understand principles of management, how to start anti-epileptic drugs, how to uh, put another one in, take one off, or however the management, and basically uh, it's all about patient management, uh, why we are here so that uh, our patients can benefit no matter you are medical professionals or ER professionals or even uh, other specialties as well, including neurology and not limited. So history of epilepsy starts from long, long ago. I mean, it is one of the oldest diseases of mankind. And in many a civilization, uh, they looked at the earliest scripture they could find and they could find uh, that epilepsy was described there. So in the past, it was described as being possession of gods, like a person has divine possession. And still we face this problem. And I'm sure all of you guys have seen that even today it is equated with black magic, especially in our society. So uh, it was started to be accepted as a brain disorder in the 1800s, the first anti-epileptic phenytoin was made in 1912. So EEG came into the fray in the 1920s. And a funny thing is that I'm sure uh, you guys will like this, that a psychiatrist by the names of Hans Berger in Germany invented the EEG. And he thought that uh, by this EEG, he could he could find out the thoughts of a brain, which was obviously, unfortunately, not correct, which was later on used in epilepsy and sleep disorders and so many other disorders. So uh, a nice interconnection of uh, various diseases is still stigmatized. And especially in our society, people do not expect to accept this diagnosis. People, people just are afraid of epilepsy, but they're famous people with epilepsy and they're all around. You see the president of the United States, Roosevelt, he had epilepsy. You see E.D., Nadia, you see Sir Elton John, Leonardo da Vinci. So epilepsy does not in itself decrease your functionality in life. And if managed properly, you can do great things. Before we understand epilepsy, we have to define what a seizure is. Now, uh, this is a very concise definition of a seizure, and you can remember it by heart. You can take a screenshot and seizure, basically, it is the transient occurrence of signs or symptoms due to abnormal, excessive, or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. I tell my patients that basically your brain produces too much electricity, and either it is on one side and there's a focal seizure happening, and either it's a complete electric discharge from all the neurons in your brains and it's a, a generalized discharge. So basically this seizure also needs to have some physical manifestations as well. Uh, maybe jerking, maybe abnormal behavior, we'll come to that later. So an excessive or a synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. So brain always has electrical activity going on, but if it happens in such a manner at the same time, and a great number, you can, uh, you can have a seizure. So usually the cortical neurons are involved. And this basically means that uh, the gray matter that is uh, in the cortex, those neurons, yeah, we can see them here as well. So those neurons are affected. This also means 
that once the cortical neurons are injured, they have a predisposition to cause seizures. They're manifested in body in different ways. Now, seizures can be of many different types. It is not necessary that a seizure is due to epilepsy. However, epilepsy obviously has seizures in that. So epilepsy, first and foremost, you should understand that uh, we need to keep ourselves muted during this meeting. And uh, yeah, so yeah, that's that sorted. So uh, first and foremost, we must always, whenever a patient comes, we should always think of a provoked seizure. Provoked seizure is a seizure that is caused by a particular event that has happened recently or in the recent past that is causing uh, the seizure. So it is by any factor that can disturb a cerebral function. So if it is provoked, then you need to move towards resolving that factor. And if that factor can be corrected, then no further treatment is required. Balle, balle, it's a really good thing if that happens. Otherwise, if it's unprovoked, then you need to, to, then you need to investigate. So here are some of the factors of provoked seizures. And some of the most common ones are obviously infectious disorders, meningitis and encephalitis. Hypoglycemia is a bad one. Many people uh, use diuretics, hyponatremia, uh, and, and in liver failure, kidney failure, you got neoplasms. So always before jumping the gun and diagnosing someone as epilepsy, you must think that the seizures may have another cause. And this is something in which your history an examination should be based on uh, in the very beginning. But uh, obviously, if you do not find such a cause, then you move towards epilepsy. This slide I included, and I believe it is very important practical slide for every one of you. We're not just discussing topics. You've done that many a times. This is very common. Patient comes to you with a seizure or an epileptic patient comes to you with seizure freedom for six months or 12 months, and then uh, the patient suddenly has seizures. So there may be a provocative factors. There are many medications that cause uh, seizures and many medications that reduce the seizure threshold. Some of the antidepressants, you can see here, other than that, there are also tricyclic antidepressants obviously uh, involved as well. Uh, you'll be surprised to see, I've highlighted theophylline and caffeine. So too much tea, too much coffee, is also a problem, antidepressant, antipsychotics, all of those things. And uh, I only just got a patient today, anti-allergics, especially the older generation ones, they reduce the seizure threshold and obviously antibiotics as well. I'm sure you guys are aware of many med uh, or such uh, medications that can uh, increase the likelihood of seizures. So you need to keep that in mind. So when will we diagnose the patient epilepsy? Again, you need to take a screenshot of this uh, very slide. So previously, epilepsy was only diagnosed when an individual had two unprovoked seizures or reflex seizures more than 24 hours apart. Let's just keep reflex seizures in the background. Let's just see two unprovoked seizures. Yani ke, uh, not two seizures in a day, not 100 seizures in a day, must be a 24-hour gap between two seizures. And uh, you must have obviously more than one or uh, a more amount. And it is unprovoked, not due to any particular cause. This patient is epilepsy. Now, uh, the definition has included that uh, this is also included. Other than that, if a person has one unprovoked seizure, and has a probability of at least 60% or more of having another seizure in the next 10 years. So how do you find that probability? Obviously, probability in such a case cannot be calculated by the help of a calculator. You must consider that if you have a positive EEG, then the chance is more than 60%. If you have two unprovoked seizures, then the chance of having another seizure in the next 10 years is more than 60%. If you have family history, so all the causes of the epi, uh, starting the anti epileptic, I'm sure you guys have read this in your books starting an anti epileptic after the first seizure. So, all the causes of that 
are included in having probability of 60% or more of another seizure in the next 10 years. So the patient is epileptic. If the patient has family history and one seizure, if the patient has a positive EEG and one seizure, uh, and uh, any gene is identified that is associated with epilepsy or a, or a pattern of uh, seizures is identified uh, with a probability of 60% plus. For example, there are myoclonic seizures and whenever myoclonic seizures happen, they have a high, very high, almost 100% chance of happening again. So a myoclonic uh, seizure would may lead you to the diagnosis of epilepsy, even if there's one seizure. I don't want to confuse you guys, but I want to explain these things. But you must keep the first definition first and foremost in the mind. So epilepsy, heck yeah, epilepsy is the liability to have recurrent seizures. A person of having an epilepsy is having an increased chance to keep having seizures. So after a first seizure, without any other uh, abnormality, usually 30 to 50% chance of having a seizure. After a second unprovoked seizure, the chance increases to 70 to 80%. So obviously, it's our definitions all around. It is the most common primary brain disorder. And uh, it's, it's got a huge burden. It's full in patients, full of patients. Obviously, you guys know that there's so many epilepsy patients. Some are undiagnosed. Some do not want to accept the diagnosis in indo pak and subcontinent third world countries. Epilepsy is quite rampant. And internationally, I know some people here are from the UK. So there, the figure basically reaches around 1%. And in our country, it reaches around 3%. There's a huge uh, difference. So there are many reasons uh, for that. We've got poor prenatal care, we've got poor antenatal care during delivery. After that, many times infections, including meningitis and encephalitis are not properly managed and uh, head injuries happen. So people have an increased predisposition of having seizures later on. So in our country, it is a higher percentage. Very important that up to 70% of these people can become seizure-free with treatment. Unfortunately, in countries like ours, 75% of patients do not receive proper treatment. So you guys need to fill this gap of making sure that all people get the proper treatment. So sometimes uh, people ask you, uh, what are the causes of epilepsy? And uh, a few years back, maybe all I would say was uh, it's unknown. However, the structural, genetic, infectious causes, important in infectious is you might be thinking that they might be provoked seizures, but the infection, if it becomes uh, resolved, uh, for example, a meningitis in which you've given a 14 to 21 day uh, treatment and the CRP normalizes, the fever goes away, the patient still has uh, an increased chance of having seizures, then the epilepsy uh, would be secondary to infectious causes, many metabolic diseases, uh, autoimmune, if uh, uh, we have the time to discuss uh, many of these conditions, obviously, including SLE and uh, other autoimmune uh, conditions can have seizures as well. So uh, anyone really, uh, let's, let's just uh, for one minute go through this. So a 13-year boy comes to the ER with the first episode of fall and to and fro.
Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I got cut. So, where were we, guys? Anyone? Dr. Vass? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so not a lot was missed. So, uh, you guys uh, go through this uh, scenario and uh, type in comments. Is it epilepsy or not? Just one seizure and uh, nothing else. So, is the patient epileptic or not? In the message. Screen not visible. Okay. Photos. Screen not Can you see it now? No. Okay. Yeah. Screen not visible. Okay. Let me just sort it out. Start with three, two. Okay. Now it should be done. So someone just had uh, one seizure. It is 100% the right kind. It's a GTC. Uh, everything looks bad, but just one seizure. Uh, MRI was normal, interictal EG was normal, family history is normal. Is this patient epileptic or not? Comments. No. Okay. Sahar says no. Dr. Nakwi says no. Mother says, everyone is right. So the patient is not epileptic. Many people have one seizure in their lifetime and not have another seizure. It is a very high percentage. So that is why uh, epilepsy is labeled as at least two or more seizures. So you classify epilepsy according to the seizures that are happening, very important. And basically, uh, you classify into generalized or focal or mixed generalized and focal epilepsies. Thus, understanding the seizure phenomenology is a must for understanding epilepsy. Now, a focal seizure, like we discussed in the beginning, comes from a focus from one part of the brain. This is the part where the electricity, just there was a spark and maybe it's in the motor area on the left side and then the right arm, there is twitching of the right arm. If it is in the temporal area, then maybe there is some behavior manifestation. If it's maybe in the parietal area, then maybe there's some dizziness or some other manifestation. Or in the occipital area, maybe the patient sees something. In generalized, uh, the, all of the brain becomes discharged at the same time. What if there is one part of the brain that becomes electrically discharged and then it becomes spreads to the entire brain. Is it generalized? Is it focal? Well, it's not generalized. It's still focal, but focal to generalize, secondary generalization. That is the terminology that we use now. So uh, we must see where the seizure started. The seizure, if the seizure started focal, then we put it in focal epilepsies. If the seizure started in the entire brain at the same time, we'd produce, we'd name generalized seizures. 
So this is a very easy classification. It used to be very difficult. And it came in the last five to six years. So you basically need to remember if the seizure was focal or generalized, the patient was aware or impaired awareness. By impaired awareness, it means that any loss of awareness. It does not mean that the patient needs to be in altered sensorium or should not be able to reply. If the reply is not 100% normal at the same time, if the patient is not 100% aware of everything that is going on uh, around the patient, then you will characterize it as impaired awareness. Otherwise, there will be full complete awareness. For example, if a patient has, again, the same example, a uh, left motor strip and the patient has right-sided uh, uh, jerks, right arm, right leg, then the patient will be completely aware of what is happening. On the same, uh, on, on a different side, if a patient has a temporal uh, onset of focal seizures and there is dystonia of the opposite arm, but at the same time, the patient cannot properly understand, sometimes replies, sometimes is not, not aware of where uh, they are at the same time. So it would be a focal onset seizure with impaired awareness. There might be motor manifestations, non-motor manifestations, generalized very easy, motor symptoms, non-motor symptoms. Very important to remember that absence seizures we'll discuss and see videos later on are non-motor uh, uh, generalized uh, seizures. So I want you guys to see this video. So whenever you see seizures, you see what is going on. So basically contraction of muscles to and fro, uncontrolled, uh, stiffness, tonic phase, maybe later on clonic phase. Yes, we see that. And a very characteristic arched back and open mouth. You often hear a grunt at the same time, a loud cry at the start, both sides of the body involved simultaneously. So is it a focal seizure or a generalized seizure in comments? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a generalized seizure. Both sides, same time. And uh, it's it's a pretty characteristic one. So we've we've gone uh, gone through this. So both sides can happen with uh, important for the neurology uh, friends around here. Myoclonic seizures are usually generalized, can be focal, but usually generalized. Absent seizures are generalized. Obviously, generalized tonic clonic seizures are generalized. And there's loss of consciousness. Patient does not remember uh, the events that happened during the seizure. It's a very characteristic uh, thing. Very important, golden point. When the patient recovers and the seizure ends and they start regaining their conscious level, they are a little bit drowsy or confused as to what is going on. So they might be asking, where am I? Who are you? What happened? And after a minute or two, they start getting better. And if they immediately, after getting up, are very aware of what is going on, have an index of suspicion that there might be something else going on. Also, a very important thing here around here, and it's a bit funny. Uh, if a person comes to you, and describes, yes, uh, uh, so this right post to confusion. If a person comes to you and says that uh, you ask what happens in your seizure, the person perfectly describes what happens in the seizures. Is the patient likely to have true seizures or pseudo seizures? Let's see the comments. Dr. Nakvi says no. No, by no, she pseudo pseudo. Yeah, so pseudo. Yeah, so you'll be surprised to know this is not correct. The patient is more likely to have real seizures. You ask the patient, do you remember these things by yourself? 
or you are narrating to me what others have told you he will say that others have told what i have told you he's very concerned about what is going on so a patient with true seizures may present and tell you all the correct things about their seizures and patients with pseudo seizures like to not tell you what is going on although obviously they are much more aware of what is going on as compared to someone uh, with true seizures so again uh, the patient does not know what is happening in the seizures at the time of having seizures but after having the seizures he asks the people or she asks the people around them uh, what was going on what happened to my arms what happened to my uh, urine how did my pants get wet how did i get the injury so they basically know everything so this is a very important point uh, more likely uh, to be uh, true seizures if the patient provides you complete information you need to ask the follow up question so this is another video so you see the eyes and blinking you see the arms in a clonic phase you see the tone increase stiffness and uh, yeah whatever they do uh, they read verses or put socks in their mouth usually the seizure resolves in 3 to 5 uh, minutes anyway so you guys need to see this very important this clinically girl has very important some seizures and you will see her have one while she's talking she's talking she's all right cuz he can be as heavy as ever as ever and off and there's a real blankness a vacant look in the eye and then all of a sudden goes off back with you and able to engage and immediately goes on sorry so absence seizures can be mistaken for days one of the hallmarks of absence is that the seizures happen many times in a day yes sometimes they're so fleeting they're easy to miss this boy is having frequent but very brief episodes yeah, so you can see his eyes flutter briefly up. go blank so this is one of our own patients so she is just never yeah so she comes back right at the end so uh, what is very important uh in this um seizure type is it is often confused in pediatric population with people in school not paying attention to their teachers the teachers complain that we ask the certain kid some questions and the uh, kid just blanks out and starts staring into the sky and actually the patient is having absence seizure and they happen so many times a day that their school performance and their school uh, uh, repertoire and their uh, reputation is uh, affected as a result so it's very important and usually the example can be seen of a light switch you just turn it off and after a few seconds you turn it on so basically their childhood absence epilepsy and it's got good prognosis it goes away uh, as the patient uh, improves but there's also juvenile absence epilepsy that starts around 10 to 12 years that usually does not go away so there's no post ictal confusion and school going uh, confusions uh, there is a hyperventilation response in eeg and otherwise uh, that can cause the seizures so it's it's very much associated with that very important so uh, myoclonic seizures uh, yeah let's first see the video and then we'll come back so sorry yeah i often become impatient in this video yeah so they he's eating rice uh, the markers at the bottom uh, see what happens when the uh, pointer which is red so usually occurs on awakening in the morning and yeah so there's a jerk like contraction happening of the entire body at the same time things can fall yeah so this 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 happens and this is quite common this i want you guys to understand some golden things around here myoclonic seizures are like rapid jerks that happen to epileptic patients you have all had myoclonic jerks that are physiological when you go to sleep and you feel that you're falling off some place and then you suddenly have a myoclonic jerk of your body or or hiccup is also a myoclonic uh, episode that is happening 
other seizure types can coexist with myoclonic seizures. So patient might be having generalized seizures and absence seizures and myoclonic seizures. So importance of asking myoclonic seizures is that the treatment of myoclonic seizures is a bit different from other seizures. Some medications for other seizures can make myoclonic seizures worse. So if you ask, if you fail to ask a person if they are having myoclonic seizures and give the patient, for example, carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine or lamotrigine, then their generalized seizures might improve, but their uh, myoclonic seizures might worsen and there might be a problem. It is seen very often. So you need to be holistic. The patient can only have myoclonic seizures such as in conditions such as juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which has great response to medication, but lifelong as the myoclonic seizure does not uh, go away. So good medications in myoclonic epilepsy include valproic acid, levetiracetam, brevaracetam, and uh, topiramate and clonazepam, etc. So uh, you uh, make a different choice. Nowadays, how these people uh, present is usually I ask the question, do you drop your cell phone while checking your Facebook status early in the morning? And the person says, how did you find that out? It used to be dropping a cup of chai or a cup of tea in the morning uh, early on a bar of soap uh, while taking a shower. But now it's breaking your cell phone in the morning. So this is very important. Tonic seizures, obviously the name suggests that increased tone, atonic seizures, uh, decrease of tone. These usually happen in um, mentally retarded or uh, patients with uh, intellectual and mental deterioration. In this type of video, you see many types of seizures. Uh, basically, there's a focal seizure that starts mm -hmm. and then a tonic seizure with a big fall and then there is a tonic episode that is going on and then starts having a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. So if a patient has atonic seizures, you need to put them on a helmet. Because important, the most important intervention is to protect their head when they fall. So uh, this is very important. So tonic and atonic seizures usually happen in patients with mental retardation or encephalopathy. So rarely seen outside the pediatric or the general neurology ward. What do you see in this video? Something is happening to the leg. Look at the other leg. Okay. Is it one leg? Is it two legs? So is it a uh, generalized seizures or is it a uh, focal seizure? Anyone? Yeah, absolutely. It is a focal seizure. Uh, we'll come back to question of uh, Dr. Hina uh, later on. Good. So focal seizure, uh, you can obviously have impaired awareness or retained awareness. The earliest symptoms are very important. The what happens first symptom? First symptom I see uh, some visual uh, things in my visual field, any, some circles, some balls, or a ghost. Okay. So that signifies that there's occipital uh, involvement early on. I hear music, uh, or my, I have an abdominal rising situation, temporal lobe. So basically you ask what happens early on, that can help in uh, localizing. You can have a temporal lobe, frontal lobe, occipital lobe, or a parietal lobe onset. Very important golden point in focal epilepsies. Try to get imaging, CT scan or MRI. It is a high probability that there might be local pathology that is causing uh, this. You can also have obviously uh, in generalized seizures, but focal even more so uh, get investigation. So in temporal lobe seizures, very much, very much confused with pseudo seizures and very much confused with psychiatric problems. So epigastric rising sensation, sense of fear. Today, a patient came and said, I just suddenly, even when I'm asleep, without any reason, start feeling that there is something going to happen right now. And my heart rate starts increasing and I settle down every time in two to three minutes. 
and she had a previous history of generalized tonic clonic seizures as well and eeg was positive as well so it is a sensation of fear that happens in the patient very likely to have temporal lobe epilepsy uh it might be wrong but it is a consideration otherwise we are obviously concerned that it is a panic attack or not if you keep start telling the patient to stop panicking the patient says i, I don't do anything it just happens out of the blue so uh, it's very important to recognize that this can happen in temporal lobe seizures and in focal seizures especially temporal lobe seizures this is also the answer to dr hena as well sometimes the duration is not limited to 3 to 5 minutes it can last for many minutes even hours even sometimes dr professor javed at at javed showed us a uh, case uh, many years back in which it lasted for one and a half day and the eeg was needed so the time limit is not uh, very much 100% it's not 100% it's usually that a seizure lasts between 3 to 5 minutes and focal epilepsy it can last a little bit more but it is not 100% unresponsiveness is common afterwards the patient may describe fatigue very important and uh, this uh, can uh, be a, a factor that suggests you patient may be amnestic to the event may not be amnestic to the event may have partial awareness so uh, you can see a temporal lobe seizure with automatisms in this kid check the face the mouth the eyes blinking the oral automatism so this is one kind of temporal um uh, seizure that takes place frontal lobe seizures are also uh, uh, very different they last for a high, longer duration have a prominent motor manifestation because the motor strip is in the uh, frontal lobe around the uh, Uh, the uh, motor area and this uh, obviously the supplementary central circle uh, ahead of the central circus so it can have bilateral motor manifestations as well for those preparing for exams you can remember the fencer position and jacksonian position it's like uh, when you shoot a bow and arrow you can remain uh, retain awareness throughout so this video will basically uh, clarify so he's having a frontal lobe seizure and bilateral motor manifestations due to a focal seizure marching pedaling yeah so many people would say this is drama or acting or a pseudo seizure or attention gaining but it's not so these pictures were drawn by someone having occipital seizures so occipital obviously associated with the eyes poorly formed images colors or lights alterations in visual perceptions well formed hallucinations can also be there one of the patient said i see a jinn uh, on one side of one side of my visual field and then uh, i suddenly lose consciousness so turned out to be uh, occipital lobe seizure they, they can draw their picture parietal lobe seizures are less common tingling and numbness obviously associated with sensation or pain in the contralateral lumbar body or sometimes prominent vertigo but do not think of it as a first cause of vertigo so is it clear till now anyone who wants to say anything or ask anything before we go on to the management and the testing should we just proceed so rf sab uh, like the video i i'm happy theek hai so how to evaluate a patient most important is to take a detailed history you need to rule out the mimics you need to rule out what else might be going on and uh, you need to sorry take a witness account of uh, what happened so ask the patient what happened ask someone who's with the patient have you seen what happened what was happening at the start what was happening at the end so both kind of histories are really important in uh, this case obviously consider provoked factors and take a detailed history including family history past medications or any other medications they might be taking and all sorts of things examination is very important if you do a complete neurological examination and you find a focal neurological symptoms it supports your diagnosis that the seizure is truly happening 
and you need to put the patient on anti-epileptics and you need to go for an MRI or a CT scan. So an exam is really important in some conditions such as tuberous sclerosis complex or neurofibromatosis uh, predispose a patient to having seizures or maybe SLE as well. So they can be found on examinations. On investigations, uh, we will uh, discuss in the next page. They are really important as well. You need to establish, was it truly a seizure or was it something else? Okay. It's not like the patient has a TIA and you put that there's a seizure. You need to first establish what are the positive signs? Is this supportive of a particular seizure type? What kind of seizure it was? Was it a GTC, myoclonic? Was the focal onset seizure? Is there an underlying cause at this time that I can correct and the seizure disorder goes away or I need to investigate further? Is it epilepsy that is happening or is it an epilepsy syndrome because of the difference in treatment? So these are the answers that you need to find. Uh, you can take a screenshot of uh, this figure and this basically is a, a very nice uh, flow chart of uh, people who present with new onset seizure and if you need to find out that if the patient needs to be on uh, anti-epileptic medication or not so you need to yeah obviously do uh, some a lot of testing and you need to get evidence as well including uh, was there a family history or not so you you take a screenshot of this very easy to digest so investigation, uh, brain imaging, MRI is preferred as compared to CT. Obviously, you want to see the gray matter, and that is more uh, easily seen in an MRI, especially in focal. But if you think have any typical findings in a generalized epilepsy as well, do go for an MRI. If a patient has seizure disorder for three years or for a lifetime and wants to take care, you have want to give the person anti-epileptics for a long time it's it's not so bad to get a brain imaging uh, what's the worst that could happen with an mri brain eeg is recommended in all cases of first uh seizures in the usa they basically say that if uh, the patient does not have any known provoking signs then you need to get an EEG because that can tell you if the patient is likely to have more seizures or not at the particular time. And uh, we will uh, discuss a little bit uh, further about uh, EEG. If you suggest that there might be infection, lumbar puncture uh, might be um, needed, you can go for a CBC. And if you think other uh, electrolyte and other screen as well, autoimmune screen and genetic testing, in, in patients that you are really concerned about. EEG, all patients with new onset unprovoked seizures, do not see the EEG if you are not good at treating the EEG. Sometimes there may be artifacts which you may report or I may report or anyone may report as epileptogenic and the patient suffers for a lifetime. So you need to be very careful with reporting and you need to have a good reporter and good experience. Okay. This EEG also helps us in finding the epilepsy type, which then helps us in guiding investigation and also choice of therapy. Some seizures, such as there is one seizure type in children known as PECS, benign epilepsy or central Rolandic epilepsy. It responds very well to carbamazepine. So an EEG will tell you that it's uh, BECTS and then you will give carbamazepine and it will respond a lot. A normal EEG does not rule out epilepsy. Patient comes to you and says, Doc Sab, a one EEG was normal, two EEG was normal. That is not correct. You can still have epilepsy even if the EEG comes out to be normal. Even if you take three EEGs and in an epileptic patient at different times with provocation, there's a still a 10% chance that the EEG can come back normal. But if the EEG comes out positive, then you are confirmed that the patient has obviously uh, an epileptic um, a syndrome uh, or epilepsy. So you can confirm uh, the diagnosis in that case as well. So here is a generalized seizure. Uh, here is a, a focal seizure, here is absence epilepsy, here are myoclonic seizures as well. Someday we'll discuss uh, EEG in detail. Yeah, I need to keep checking if uh, we're still online or not. So 
differences between typical and atypical seizures. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll come to that later in the end. So MRI can help. Uh, this is mesial temporal uh, epilepsy. You see uh, such a wonderful mesial temporal uh, lobe in this side, but a very degenerated one on this. So this is the focus by which seizures are happening. Here as well, you see as compared to this, this is not well formed and similar here as well. And then there's some T2 hyperintensity as well. So basically MRI can tell you, and this is a tumor that was diagnosed in a focal epilepsy patient. Here it is, and here it is. This uh, one side of the brain is degenerated and the patient had right-sided seizures. So it was the Rasmussen's and cephalitis uh, that was diagnosed. So differential diagnosis of seizures and epilepsy obviously include syncopal attacks, TIAs, migraines, deliriums, and the most important one, PNES. And it's sometimes very difficult to differentiate this with epilepsy or epileptic seizures. And there are some ways to do that. And we'll discuss that. Transient global amnesia and sleep disorders are also different. So this is a six item tool which basically uh, people in the UK, I'm sure uh, they use it more often than not, differentiate PNES from epileptic seizures. And there's some differences, but remember, these are not 100%. These can uh, take you to one side, but you may still have the other side. Uh, but you get a good understanding of the case when you put all these six items. And then, what you do is, if you're still not sure, you do a video EEG, which is the gold standard. And you see if the patient has a seizure during the video EEG. And if the EEG shows that the patient is having an electrographic seizure on the EEG uh, monitor, you can see it. And the patient is having epilepsy. Otherwise, it is psychogenic non-epileptic form seizure happening at that time. You can uh, use this tool to have a reasonable understanding, but again, it is not 100%. Check this video. Yeah, so uh, later on found to be psychogenic. The EEG was crystal clear during the episode as well, just the muscle art effects. Otherwise, this is a very purposeful uh, uh, movement that was happening at that time and was very much associated with psychological stresses. Now, very important, when to start treatment? Basically, whenever a diagnosis of epilepsy is confirmed, which is when two or more seizures happen and 24 hours apart, Single seizure with evidence of a high chance of recurrence, more than 60%, which means a positive EEG or an epilepsy syndrome, a remote symptomatic cause, any patient had a stroke one year back or meningitis two years back and now has seizures or a bleed and then follow it. If the patient has absence or myoclonic seizures, then you start the medication. They are liable to happen again, almost 100%. If there's abnormal neurological exams, if there's seizure during sleep, then a high chance, more than 60% of happening again, then you must start medication. Family history is positive. There is structural abnormality on the MRI. Otherwise, in these two causes, patient may be having just one seizure and you start the medication. Sometimes the family says we can't tolerate another seizure. Sometimes the employment, uh, employment nature says you do, can't afford any other seizure. The drug that you choose, basically there, the first line treatment of epilepsy is anti-epileptic drug treatment, AAD. You must be very careful that the drug must be effective for the seizure type, must control seizures, has least amount of patient side effects, patient specific side effects. The patient is obese, you will not choose a medication that increases weight. You will choose a medication that will decrease weight. And similarly, if the patient is also having a mood disorder or aggression, you will choose something that decreases aggression, not something 
that increases aggression. If somebody has a liver function derangement, you will choose something that goes through the kidneys or not metabolized through the liver. So uh, sometimes the thing is that the side effects may be minimum. Otherwise, the better option is that the patient needs that medication and it is per patient basis. It must be affordable. You can't give a medication that costs 600 or 500 rupees to someone who earns 300 rupees a day. Uh, so that, that's not practical. You must try to give monotherapy. The drug must be appropriate amount for the patient. 100 kg person taking valproic acid 250 in the morning, 250 in the evening is not correct. Valproate has not failed that patient or similarly a valproate of the same uh, uh, dosage. Proper counseling and adherence is very important. And in Pakistan, a high percentage, I'm sure in foreign countries as well, people come with non-adherence. They leave their medication once the seer uh, is fine after a few months or skip their medication and it becomes very difficult to find out if they were having seizures because of any other reason or leaving the medications. So you must check the patient if they are adherent and how to increase adherence by properly counseling of what the medication can do and what the medication is going to do. There's some lifestyle modifications, obviously, that you need to tell the patient. And some of the most important ones concern driving in which they should avoid driving. And you can see the DVLA rules of the UK and understand them very good and usually followed in a lot of uh, countries worldwide. Otherwise, swimming is prohibited unless the patient is seizure-free or you get a lifeguard as well. If they're taking a bath and a high, uh, if they're in a shower, that uh, the door is closed and it's locked and it's a hot shower, they might have a seizure and burn themselves. So you might ask them to take baths instead of shower with someone who is uh, 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 informed at the same time to take care of them if something like happens and uh, stay away from uh, high risk uh, uh, jobs and uh, using uh, knives and, and, and such things which might cause them a problem. So the best medication is the one which we are often asked, what is the best medication? Well, the best medication are so many. There are like 10 best medications. There are 20 best medications. Uh, best medication can be something that is best for the patient. And sometimes the best medication is what you are most comfortable in and what you are able to monitor as well. So if these things uh, become the same, then you become a good, good practitioner of epilepsy. So let me just see uh, if uh, everyone has gone. No, we've still got 24 people who are still interested and are ready to learn. Will not take a lot of time, just five to 10 minutes. Uh, so this is a table if you want to see. Basically, it's, it's from current uh, neurology. I want to tell you guys that just see the red lines around here. So there are some medications that make absence seizures work worse. See the green. There are some medications that make the myoclonic seizures worse. And there are many medications that work just as well on focal seizures and generalized tonic-clonic seizures. So if there are, and but there are some medications as well which are only indicated for focal seizures, but are not indicated uh, for generalized seizures as of yet. And obviously, so you must be very careful what medication you are giving to uh, someone who has a particular, if uh, I would ask, uh, if you just say, tell us five medications to remember, I'd say you learn about valproic acid, you learn about clonazepam, you learn about carbamazepine, lamotrigine is a powerful tool in the hands of an, a neurologist or a medical specialist, but you must be very careful about it. It can cause a Steven Johnson type reaction, but if you do it properly, if you start it properly, it is not uh, dangerous that much. So pyramid, yeah, levitrestam, surely, and now as the time goes on, lacosamide is becoming important as well. So if you remember these medications, you are probably good to go. 
these are two uh, new medications that have come into the market, Brivaracetam and Sinobomate. This has come into Pakistan as well. This is yet to come into Pakistan. Benefit of Brivaracetam is that Levitrestam can sometimes cause mood problems. And you can switch these patients to Brivaracetam and uh, they do not have mood problems. Sinobomate, especially for neurology and other PGRs, Sinobomate is a medication that has high seizure freedom, highest in the last 30 years. So more than 95%, 90% patients had seizure freedom when Sinobomate was used as compared to Levitracetam, Lamotrigine, etc., which had 60 to 75% seizure freedom. So it is a very highly effective medication, but it also has slow titration due to some side effects. It will come into the market in Pakistan in a few years as well. And if it is well tolerated in aftermarket trials as well, it will probably be a revolution, especially for those people in which the other medications do not work and they are resistant epileptic patients. So we have good hopes with this medication. Uh, so you can take a screenshot of this uh, basically slide as well. This uh, shows that these are the broad spectrum anti-epileptic drugs, including Brevarestam, Clobazam, Lamotrigine, Levitrestam, Topiramate, Valproid, which you can use in generalized as well as focal epilepsy. But these medications can only be used in focal epilepsies or secondary generalized epilepsies, which definitely includes carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine. Leucosamide now is entering into this category, uh, basically, but uh, very important to remember, you do not give carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine as first-line generalized uh, therapy. So sometimes uh, you give a first-line therapy, you give a very good dose of levitracetam, 500 milligram in the morning and 500 milligram in the evening to someone. So basically, there can happen three things. They might be successful or they might obviously fail. Failure is due to either the lack of efficacy or poor tolerability. If there's poor tolerability, obviously uh, you can switch the drug and go to another medication. If there's lack of efficacy, you basically increase the dose and then see if there is a benefit. If it does not help and you reach to a dose that is maximum or that is the maximum tolerated dose, you add another anti-epileptic drug. And usually it is seen that if a seizure does not go away with two or three well-tried anti-epileptic proper medications in good doses, then it's not going to go away any, any time soon. You may have to consider uh, other therapies, including uh, surgery, including vagal nerve stimulator, including uh, ketogenic diet as well. However, sometimes the third and fourth anti-epileptic do work in some patients because the first ones were not really that appropriate for that procedure type. You must prefer monotherapy if a patient has to take a long duration of medication. We'll come to that, how much time a patient basically takes the medication. But try to have one anti-epileptic. In some diseases such as Parkinson's disease, you want to have moderate doses of many Parkinson drugs. But in epilepsy, you want to have one anti-epileptic with more dose because studies were done and showed that people who were taking small doses of multiple medications were worse off than one uh, high dose. Now, there are special circumstances that you must remember. First and foremost is pregnancy, Oxcarbazepine, levitrestam, lamotrigine, and carbamazepine are fine in pregnancy. Now research is coming saying topiramate is fine as well. I really would wait a few years because it used to be pregnancy category X a few years back. So you just remember uh, these three and four. Uh, also remember that lamotrigine levels decrease during pregnancy. So a patient who is stable on lamotrigine might become pregnant and start having seizures unless you increase the uh, dose of lamotrigine. So very important, especially for neurology, PGS for others. Just remember uh, that uh, there are these are the safer ones. In renal failure, you give after the dialysis, you adjust dose and liver disease, your liver safe ones. 
such as levitrastem or topiramate. So levitrastem is particularly good. The common pitfalls in treatment include the wrong diagnosis. It's not epilepsy at all, or it is a wrong drug for seizure type. Sometimes you start giving, so the patient has focal onset, generalized onset, or myoclonic as well, and you start giving carbamazepine, so the myoclonic start increasing, and you think that uh, the medications have failed and the patient cannot improve. No. You need to choose a better medication for that particular patient. You need to choose something that covers all these seizure sites. For absent seizures, for example, valproic acid, levitracetam, ethosuximide are uh, important medications. So if you choose anything else, even at an appropriate dose, that is not a good trial. So you sometimes use wrong drugs. Non-compliance in Pakistan, I'd say number one cause is non-compliance. Ignoring drug-drug interactions. For example, giving valproate and carbamazepine together. So these will mess with each other at that time. Otherwise, you're giving other medications that might decrease levels of uh, uh, like OCPs and uh, lamotrigine. So OCP will decrease lamotrigine. So consider this, that there might be drug-drug interactions uh, happening. Do not treat serum levels unless you are, are dealing with pregnant patients or uh, uh, discussing uh, uh, resistant cases. And it is a taboo in society. People don't even want to take treatment. You need to educate them. You need to give them proper counseling. You need to tell them that there is treatment and you need to support the patient and take out the taboo. Last but not the least, when to stop anti-epileptic medication. Now, it used to be said that it's three years, but now it's two to five years of seizure freedom. So some studies basically said two was fine and some said five was fine and both were almost equally comparable. So we usually choose something between two and three years. Seizure freedom, two to three years on anti-epileptic drugs, but the patient must have a single type of seizure, must have a normal neurological examination. The EEG becomes normal. And when you stop the medication, the patient does not have seizures as well, obviously, later on. So all these conditions are met and the patient is seizure-free. So you do it very slowly. And if seizures reoccur, you give lifelong treatment. Why? Patient asks you, why should I take a medication for life? Because it has been seen that the problems with having seizures are more and the risk of having seizures is more than having anti-epileptic drug treatment for a long time. So you need to tell the patient it is beneficial for you to become seizure-free. We will choose a good medication, but that is how you are going to proceed. For you, you must have a good realistic approach on what the patient is going to achieve and the patient must have a re good realistic approach. They must not think that your medication will treat the epilepsy in three to six months. That is not realistic. That causes problems later on. The patient might come back once or twice, but that is not the right thing to do. You must tell them the absolute correct consideration. This is a thing that is really important. The patient-doctor bond. You must propose and do not impose. The patient usually tells you which medication and which side effects and which cost they are comfortable in, or they might ask you to choose for them, but you might must offer them uh, different options and uh, different forms of treatment. You are there to give them support. If seizures can't stop me, nothing can, said the patient who wrote a lot of books. And with this, with a long, long presentation, I thank you. Some of you already left. I'm thankful to people uh, who have stayed. Okay, difference between typical and atypical seizure. Well, Asa, it could mean anything. It's, it's not a part of uh, particular specific literature. Uh, typical and atypical uh, seizures. So everyone is open to have uh, their own indication and their own uh, 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 description of these two terms. These are not scientific terms. So a typical for someone might mean that last three to five minutes and atypical might have uh, 
uh, higher and previously uh, obviously the um, complex seizures and with impaired awareness was also said as a, a typical seizures but this is not scientific terminology uh, anyway and SGS is not rare and only in HLA uh, B1502 positive patients well Increased risk of having SJS in people with HLA B1502 patients taking carbamazepine, but this is not absolute that a patient who's HLA B1502 negative cannot have SJS positive, and that is more for carbamazepine and not for lamotrigine. Uh, the test is uh, performed in Pakistan as well. And uh, other than that, uh, uh, Dr. Hinna, so. Uh, it's very difficult to comment uh, if uh, this particular seizure type uh, is uh, true or a pseudo seizure. EEG might might give you a clue in this, and uh, taking a history of uh, if the scenario of it happening is the same at all times, which basically makes it a little bit uh, doubtful. We will plan a session on EEG, inshallah. Next Thursday, we will try something. We'll have another speaker, Dr. Mubin, who is a radiologist. Uh, he will come and, inshallah, uh, talk to everyone about MRI brain, T1, T2 flare sequences, what to do, what not to do, how to find, and so many other things. So I'm, I'm sure you guys will like it. I am glad for you guys who stayed. Thank you, Umar. Thank you, Asa. Thank you, Madam Sir. And, and have a, a good, good evening. Thank you. Join us on even more sessions. Thank you, Dr. Umar. And with this, I will stop unless someone has a question that they need to uh, un unmute their mic for. Thank you. So I've forgotten half the things that I posted there. So I'm glad they're still there. So take care and have a good night. And thank you guys for coming. Love this.